Uh, hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cancer Patient Lab. And I'll just take care of a, some of the housekeeping before I turn turn it over to Amit. Uh, there are two basic uh, kind of disclosures that we like to say at the front here. One is that uh, anything you say can and will be used and made public. So it's a Miranda <laughs> rights. Uh, so this is a public conversation. If that's a concern for you, change your name. Don't say anything and hide your, your video image. And the second is, as you've probably heard many times, this is not medical advice. Uh, these sessions are to give patients and caregivers information that they can take to their doctors or medical teams. Um, so uh, this is not medical advice. And uh, of course, take any uh, particular issues you have to your, to your medical team. Uh, with those disclaimers out of the way, turn it over to Amit. Thanks, Brad. Um, so as probably some of you know that uh, I got treated by Dr. Onik in uh, January, uh, middle of January this year. Uh, so I'm in active treatment with him right now. Um, you probably also know from various you know posts and stuff in the community that uh, I'd reached kind of an end of line for the standard of care set of treatments. Uh, they haven't been working for me for quite some time, you know, uh, but uh, they they kept giving me some extensions. Um, but given my disease had uh, disease uh, has a spread in the bone marrow, uh, my myelosuppression is very very high, and which meant uh, hemoglobin below eight, platelet counts low. Uh, generally, my hemoglobin would hover between six and seven, uh, and with a little bit of blood transfusion, it'll go up. But what it, what it meant is that I was kind of you know, not going to be accepted in any of the trials. You know, the trials want hemoglobin above eight typically. Um, and uh, uh, other complexity has been that uh, my disease has also evolved into a neuroendocrine disease. So with neuroendocrine disease, it's not pure adenocarcinoma. You know, trials generally don't accept mixed cancer types because they're trying to prove a particular point in a particular direction for stuff. And then the hemoglobin just, uh, you know, is a, is a cutoff that I, I, I couldn't meet. So for past full five months, I've been searching for various treatment options, alternate treatment options. And I came across uh, uh, Dr. Onik through a conversation that happened here in CPL originally. That's how I, uh, you know, his name came up and I kind of started to look into that and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what what I uh, what this could mean to me, and uh, I had already gone through an immunotherapy trial, which didn't work uh, with Ketruga. So uh, again, this is uh, me, as as Dr. Onik will explain. Uh, you know, it is an immunotherapy uh, treatment, um, but it it uh, is a different approach to the treatment. And uh, then I started to see, okay, who else does this approach? So I I explored that idea with. Uh, uh, you know, a few others that I could find uh, that, you know, use this type of approach. And I finally concluded that um, Dr. Anik is my best choice for treatment and um, went and put my, um, you know, my you know, uh, eggs in that basket, so to say. And, uh, you know, five, my treatment was five weeks uh, back. Um, we are still in the process of figuring out how it is, you know, uh, what it is, uh, I mean, how effective it is. So we'll, we'll know in a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks, uh, you know, two things will happen. My, um, uh, you know, PSMA scans will be back and then my uh, biopsy from next gen uh, in Germany would be back. And, you know, those are the things that will give us forward looking direction. So that said, I'll hand it over to Dr. Onik to kind of introduce, uh, introduce uh, his, uh, the speciality and the treatment that he actually has uh, uh, is providing. So, thank you, Amit. Uh, so, here, oh, here it is. Here. Okay. So, uh, basically, um, can you see it now? We can. Okay. So. Um, Basically, what we what we're doing is uh, intratumoral immunotherapy, 
And we feel that it really is the next uh, frontier in immuno-oncology versus uh, giving the medication systemically like they are uh, doing right now. So let me just show you what the process includes. So for now, we're going to call this the ONIC method. It's got other names, but, but for this forum, let's call it the ONIC method. Uh, and what we're doing is we're actually priming the immune system to react to the drugs that it didn't react to before um, and to unmask the tumor so it can be recognized. So uh, piece number one is, is a release of the tumor antigens. We do that using something called a non-ablative freeze. Um, oh, by the way, all of this is uh, covered in a patent that was just issued in March of 23. So, um, you know, I, I can present it to you without any uh, worries. Uh, and so we use a very special type of freezing called the non-ablative freeze, and we le release the tumor antigens without killing the vasculature and, uh, and the mechanisms for immune cells to get into the lesion. If you do a regular freeze, uh, it's an avascular lesion and it doesn't do you any good. Uh, once that thaws and we have these released antigens, we inject medications into that area. Uh, GMCSF, also known as leukine, also known as sagramostim, a PD-1 inhibitor and a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Sometimes we use a PDL one We add that in and, and we can talk about why, you know, we might want to add, have both of them uh, involved. And uh, uh, sometimes we'll use a LAG-3 a inhibitor uh, if our genetic testing shows that that might be of any value. So what we do is we stick all of these things together in one place, and that hopefully will trigger what is called an episcopal effect that will train the uh, lymphocytes to go to other areas um, in the body and kill tumors that are throughout the body. Uh, so we only treat one small lesion and hopefully we'll get numerous lesions to react to that. Uh, there are three tumor types that are called, that are cold tumors. And there are three very important tumors. That's pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. There are no approved immunotherapy regimens for these cancers. They have tried uh, all sorts of ways to get a, um, a positive reaction, including adding other uh, chemotherapies to them um, and uh, to the immunotherapy. And uh, there are no uh, responses for these three very important cancers, I think you'll agree. So. Um, how do we do with these cancers that have never been shown to react uh, to immunotherapy? Well, this is a patient. Um, there's an 83-year-old lady who had uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Uh, because of her age and her medical condition, she really wasn't a candidate for other uh, treatments. And, uh, you know, the the Fulfirinox uh, major chemotherapeutic agents. And uh, uh, here's her primary cancer in the tail of the pancreas. And this is just one slice of her scan. And she has numerous uh, lesions within her liver. And her lifespan, you know, literally was measured in, in months, you know, if not weeks uh, with this kind of tumor burden in her liver. At one month, you can see that the activity in the PET scan is markedly decreased. The tumor looks like it's uh, you know, a little bit smaller and the lesions in the liver have markedly decreased in their uh, intensity. And here at three months, you can see that the tumor is gone. These are kidneys, so don't worry about those. And uh, there are no lesions left in her liver. So um, in a tumor that uh, doesn't respond to immunotherapy, uh, this is uh, a complete response. 
she has had a recurrence in her uh, pancreas uh, at one year, and we are working on dealing with that. But her uh, uh, liver remains disease-free. Um, here's a patient with a very rare cancer, a metastatic squamous, uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, just a handful each year, uh, no known treatment. Uh, and you can see here is her primary, and um, uh, she and this is disease that's throughout her uh, peritoneum, and you can see a uh, marked response and marked response in the uh, uh, primary tumor. This is a patient. This is one of our first patients. This is the first patient we did with pancreatic cancer. Uh, node in the chest. Primary tumor, primary tumor here, and uh, primary tumor has no activity, and the node in the chest has shrunk and has no activity. And uh, this was a, a complete response in the first patient we ever treated with pancreatic cancer. Uh, patient with metastatic breast cancer, uh, numerous bone lesions uh, throughout her spine, sternum and many other areas. This is her heart, no worries about that, but she has gotten a, a complete metabolic response in uh, this and she's going on uh, a full year with no evidence for disease. A uh, patient with metastatic prostate cancer, this is the first patient we ever treated. Um, you can see his scans, uh, he's got a tumor uh, growing out of the bladder and he had multiple uh, nodal disease, and uh, uh, seven weeks after the treatment, he had uh, no evidence for tumor. His PSA uh, went to zero. He had had a radical prostatectomy and a recurrence uh, after that, and um, he literally had weeks to live. He was uh, going to hospice, and uh, he had one treatment, and he is now eight years uh, going on nine years free of disease uh, with a castrate resistant metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, this is my personal experience. Um, I seem to look better in that picture than I do in person now. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, it was a couple of years ago, I guess. And uh, basically I was diagnosed with a very aggressive cancer. My PSA was 138, I had meds to my bone uh, and pelvis um, and lymph nodes uh, throughout my body. I underwent uh, two treatments, two cycles, and um, I just had my five-year uh, survival party uh, with no metastatic disease uh, in uh, the beginning of December. Uh, this is just uh, some pictures, uh, large pelvic mass, uh, and uh, after the treatment that was uh, uh, gone. Here you can see, this is a PET scan. You can see a, uh, this is my prostate, huge prostate tumor, multiple nodal masses and a bone met. And uh, uh, all of that resolved and my PSA went down to 0.7. Um, it's now about 2.4. Uh, and uh, I remain without evidence for metastatic disease. So um, we took our first uh, 27 patients that we did, uh, consecutive patients, and uh, we uh, basically did a, a, a study. It was a retrospective, in a sense, prospective study because the results were followed prospectively. Uh, but we went back and looked at the, these, these patients. We had a, a contract research organization um, examine all the data um, as if it was a, a, a regular trial. Um, and uh, this was peer reviewed and we sent it uh, um, into the American Association of Cancer Research, which is the premier cancer research organization. Uh, and uh, these were our results. We had uh, 18 evaluable prostate cancer patients, and 50% uh, of those patients 
had a complete response. Uh, six patients with non-prostate cancer, there were 33% that had a partial response. Um, the side effects were fewer than expected. We did have one death related to a cardiac event. Um, and uh, we've done about 200 patients since then. We have not had uh, any mortality uh, since that point. Uh, what was the cause of this? Um, we think it was the, a, a pulmonary embolus. Uh, this patient was bedridden, already had decubitus ulcers. And when we treated her, uh, she had a marked response and she started walking around. And, um, you know, we were remiss in not giving her uh, embolic prophylaxis. Um, uh, this is um, a patient uh, that was my college uh, buddy. We used to kayak together. He had a pleomorphic sarcoma. I'm almost finished, by the way. Uh, he had a pleomorphic sarcoma um, to his uh, mesentery, multiple tumors, and uh, liver lesions. And he was not a chemo candidate because of his uh, heart problems. And um, he, um, we treated him. He had all of his um, intra-abdominal tum intra tumors uh, respond and then uh, had uh, uh, most of his liver tumors respond and uh, and I'm going to show you what that means. So uh, this is a very specific treatment. It's specific to the um, to the tumor that we are making the vaccine out of and not necessarily all tumors that a patient has if they've got a large number of Mets um, uh, have the same genetics. And so a patient might have disease that responds and some disease that doesn't respond. So um, a patient might have a large volume of disease and uh, they get an excellent response, but uh, their immune system becomes exhausted. So uh, they may need adjunctive IV medication. So, you know, this is really, um, uh, in a sense, the priming of the system and the first um, treatment, first potential treatment in a series of treatments to get to the, pa to get the patient to no evidence for disease. So, so he had the pleomorphic sarcoma, liver mesentery, he was unresectable. Uh, we treated him. Mesentery had a complete response. Liver had a partial response. He got Y90, and uh, his liver got a complete response. Then two years later, he had a recurrence in the mesentery, uh, but it was surgically resectable, so he had um, surgery. So he has no evidence for disease, and we have put him on systemic immunotherapy as an adjuvant to prevent any disease uh, from growing up. And at this point, he remains a no evidence disease in terms of the liver and uh, the mesentery. So uh, what can we say about uh, you know, this type of process? Well, uh, it's an unusual treatment because it is unique, I think, in the history of cancer therapy in that it is the first treatment that so far has worked on every tumor type we have tried it on. Usually, uh, obviously, immunotherapy is, is tumor type specific because there's, you know, the big three doesn't respond to it. Um, there is uh, chemotherapy is tumor type specific, different regimens, different cancers. Um, and, uh, you know, what we have found is every single tumor we have tried this on has responded. That's unique in cancer therapy. Uh, large volume tumors will sometimes need adjuvant uh, traditional therapy. 
systemic uh, immunotherapy. Um, you know, we try and stay away from chemotherapy, uh, radiation, or surgery. It's extremely, it has extremely low morbidity. Um, we're, not, we're not seeing the side effects that they see with traditional immunotherapy. Uh, we haven't seen any uh, pneumonitis or uh, hepatitis. Uh, we've seen one case in 200 of some bowel uh, inflammation that responded to treatment. And so a very low uh, morbidity and side effects. Uh, durable responses. Um, these responses, in my case, last, lasting five years. Uh, others um, have lasted uh, many years. Uh, and so uh, right now we don't know why um, certain patients uh, will uh, need other therapies later on. Uh, this is currently being carried out uh, under an off-label use on the, uh, in terms of the FDA. So we're able to treat patients uh, because everything we're using um, is approved, but we're using it off-label. And so the FDA allows us to do that. Uh, we have a um, trial that um, we're uh, going to be carrying out. We have, we, uh, it was approved um, and uh, uh, we didn't have any money to accrue any patients. We are looking for um, funding now and we are hopeful that we'll be getting it in the not too distant uh, future. Um, our, our goal is to get this to patients as quickly as possible. And that obviously means that we have to do um, you know, FDA trials and, uh, you know, that's our, that's our goal. So we're looking for centers to, of expertise, with expertise to join the program. We just added a, a center in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. We've got a center in Utah and we've got a, and a center in Florida. So we've got three so far. Um, we uh, have an FDA approved uh, phase two, a basket study. And that's that trial, it was a basket study. We were gonna treat all sorts of cancers, um, but uh, we've changed our um, focus uh, to pancreatic cancer because we've been getting such uh, remarkable results in pancreatic cancer. And those patients have so little, um, so few options uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if we have limited money, that's the group I think we should be working on. And that's it. Thank you, Dr. Anik. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so for the audience, you know, typically we use uh, this um, these hand feature in Zoom uh, for questions, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions here. So I will just uh, kind of, uh, you know, keep an eye and, uh, uh, start with the question. So okay. first is uh, uh, Robert. Okay. So a couple questions. Um, now you're using <clears throat> PDL one or PD one inhibitor, so it's uh, or you know an, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Yes. Have you run into well with any of these? Have you run into any issues with autoimmune disease or? Uh, by intertumoral intratumoral yeah the, that the, that? yeah the autoimmune disease that we that we're that we've seen uh, is far in the, in the okay. i'm sorry hey, rick, can you mute your mute your phone rick okay yeah go ahead um, the autoimmune side effects that we've we've seen have been um limited uh you know, the, the side effects that you worry about with um, usual uh, immunotherapy, um, as I said, are, are pneumonitis, uh, hepatitis, and um, colitis. Um, we haven't seen those. Uh, we've had one possible case of colitis, although it wasn't classic. Um, and so that's a question mark. But um, you know, let's say we've had one in 200, which is quite, you know, uh, remarkable. 
The one thing that we worry about the most is myocarditis. Um, we monitor patients uh, very closely for that. Um, and uh, we've seen one uh, case of myocarditis um, out of those 200 patients. So uh, that's very unusual. Uh, the thing we've seen the most probably is thyroid problems uh, and uh, hypothyroidism. And if that's the case, uh, obviously we monitor for that as well. And uh, we'll do thyroid replacement. Um, and usually we're in good shape for that. And my second question is, and this is more personal, um, I was on Keytruda for a few sessions or, you know, a few doses, and I actually had hyper progression with Keytruda, um, even though I was MSI high and high tumor mutational burden and all. Um, does that mean your approach might, again, I might have something like that? Uh, it's a question you can't just say yes or no, but yeah, um, you know, we get genetic testing to see if there are um, there are certain genes that seem to indicate hyperprogression. Um, usually, we'll give one treatment before we get that genetic testing. Um, there are we're exploring ways of um, limiting the effect of uh, hyperprogression, Mark Taylor is working with us on, on that. Um, and um, uh, because you had hyperprogression with systemic therapy, I'm not sure it necessarily relates to our therapy, but it could, don't know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anik, uh, you can stop the screen share so that uh, everybody can see more faces and uh, um, uh, on the Zoom okay. call. So next is uh, Brad. Yes, um, I'm a lymphoma patient and I'm getting a cancer vaccine uh, coming up in the next, uh, by the end of the month. And uh, associated with that is something similar to what you were describing it. If there's a drug called lenalidomide, and I was wondering if that's in if you know that drug and whether that is also kind of an immune system enhancer, uh, similar to the ones that you're putting in that second step in your process. Um, I'm not familiar with it. Um, if you send me the um, information on it, I'll look it up. I'll look it up and and consider it. See what, what you think. Thanks. Alan. Alan Morris, you have a question? You're on mute. I will come back to that. Ian from New Zealand. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, uh, just very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Onik, and uh, just one disclosure that I did uh, with a previous oncologist try and get in contact with you about 18 months ago, but we uh, struggled to coordinate time zones. Um, but I've got a better oncologist now. Um, my question was around, because uh, I've got advanced stage four, Gleason 9, advanced prostate cancer, like, a bit like yourself, uh, with multiple METs, been through chemo. What are the uh, criteria for your treatment? So I've had chemo and I'm on the normal uh, ADT, fairly low PSA at the moment of 0.5, and SUVs have shrunk down around two, et cetera. You need a certain size of tumour to start the treatment, or can you do it at any stage? Yeah. Uh, do you know, we... we... If a patient is already on ADT and they're tolerating it well, and they're not, you know, completely cap straight resistant, meaning a rising PSA, uh, we'll just usually tell them just stay on it until you um, are are cap straight resistant. Um, I think it's it's a uh, you know, it, starting out, 
if you're just newly diagnosed, I think we're better off trying that then than you know trying it as a as a first treatment. Um, uh, because what we have found is that we can get uh, some major responses and then um, either go on to something like LU-177 and get a complete response or have a patient who uh, is going on ADT but will get a better response and a, more, and a longer term response from ADT. One of the first patients we ever treated um, was a fellow with very widespread a disease. His PSA was uh, 1800 when we first saw him. And um, he got a marked response. Uh, PSA went down to 200, then started to rise again. Now, now we would have put him on systemic therapy and he might have gotten a complete response. But, but the reason I'm, I'm telling you is that we went on, he went on ADT and he's now nine years, going on nine years um, on ADT and hasn't become cancer resistant yet. And uh, my experience is in patients with that kind of disease, um, they become cancer resistant pretty quickly. Um, so um, it's a long-winded answer to to your question, um, uh, which is, uh, if your PSA is rising, I need to have something to measure, basically. You know, if you're, uh, and I don't want to take you, take somebody off ADT if they've responded to it. So um, uh, if your PSA is uh, 0.5 and you have demonstrable disease on a PSMA scan, it doesn't have to be more than you know a centimeter, a centimeter and a half to be useful for us to make a um, vaccine out of. Then you might be a candidate. Okay. Um, sorry. So just to follow up on that. See, so I am just my low point was 0 0.07. So I am starting to rise, to rise, and the view. Sorry, personal question. Uh, and with the oncologists are talking about going on to abiraterone as a second line. So it would, and I do have multiple meds still based on PSMA scan. So that would still be the type of. Yeah. Have uh, you have you been on enzalutamide? No, my initial is gozzarella. Okay. So so you haven't gone on second line therapy. No. Um, if I was in that situation, um, I would get I would um, have our treatment. And then, um, if it didn't work, go on the second line therapy. Okay. Um, okay, so I might contact you separately. I do have your contact details. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, Alan, you can um, talk in, uh, you know, through the phone line or wherever you're calling from. Um, is there a way to unmute uh, Brad? Is there a way to unmute Alan's five three zero number? Can you hear me now? You can hear me now. Fantastic. Hi, Doctor Onig. I'm I'm so glad you're giving this talk, and I want to congratulate you on your miraculous seeming cure. Um, I wanted to drill down with my first series of questions, if you will allow me, just on your formula. Sure. Um, and, and I've divided into three components right now. The cryosurgical lysis. Uh, the second thing is you inject leukine into the bed. And the third one is you give immune checkpoint inhibitors. I presume you must give that the same standard way, which is intravenous. Is that correct? No, no we give them, we give it all into the tumor. Oh, wow. That is impressive. Okay. Um, interesting. Now, as far as cryosurgical lysis goes, um, I, I imagine you could not possibly do that to bone mets, which is the most common met uh, in uh, prostate cancer patients. Is that correct? You cannot do cryosurgery on bone, can you? Yes, we do. Oh, wow. That is impressive. Yeah, we definitely do bone mets. 
uh, routinely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because um, the actual vault, I mean, wouldn't you want to pick something that it has relatively large volume. So you give, you get a relatively large volume of neoantigen release. And I imagine the combined part of the bone, unless it's fractured, the actual tumor volume for an isolated MET would be re relatively small. Is, is that not the case? No, um, uh, basically we're only making, we make a standard um, cryosurgical lesion or, you know, freezing, free, free, freezing lesion. Um, it's, it's only about a centimeter in diameter. So it's a very small lesion. And, uh -huh. and, and so, um, it's not really a, a, a problem that way. Okay. Um, I have to admit, uh, I'm going to try my own little formula for um, auto vaccination, which is I just coincidentally happen to be going into a second BCR. I plan on getting a PSMA PET scan. I presume it's going to light up a few. Um, I'm hoping it's just oligomenostatic and it lights up a few skeletal lesions. I'm going to go the route of SBRT as opposed to cryosurgery, I think you suggested you believe cryo theoretically should be a better lysis technique than, than a radiation therapy. Um, that actually somewhat flies in the face of my uh, understanding that conventional wisdom is that radiotherapy is actually in and of itself uh, an immune adjuvant. Do you not believe that? Um, you know, they've, uh, I've read that it is, uh, but nobody can show me any um, consistent data to, to really prove that. Um, I uh, believe the conventional wisdom is that the scopal effect was um, actually seen uh, via SBRT treatment. Um, but never mind. I, 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 I do want yeah. to. Uh, you know, okay. all I can, you know, if you look at our patent, we have a whole bunch of ways that you can do the same thing. Right. Okay. You know, um, uh, so um, yeah, if, if video I might work, um, you know, uh, as well, I would urge you if you're going to do that. I'm sorry, I've got my phone going off here. I urge you to to do it um, with um, uh, intratumoral injection um, to the lesion because giving it getting a um, you know SBRT plus uh, systemic um is not going to do it i don't think okay maybe i'll be signing up with you but if i could drill down more um the leukine i saw your formula was 30 daily sub q doses can you tell me what your dose is for sub q uh leukine yeah it's a standard dose it's uh uh 250 micrograms per day okay um it, it, actually not to be i guess it's going to sound like a majority the, the actual dosage is 250 micrograms per square meter, and the average man is 1.9. So the standard dose is actually 500. Am I wrong on that? No, you, no, you're not wrong. Um, but you uh, we don't, we don't, we we have found that that this uh, amount works. Okay. Um, we can tell by you know the response in terms of the patient's Y count going up, and Leukine is just too expensive to use that way. Okay. So um, we do intratumorally use it, the 500. Right. But okay. The, the but systemically, we'll, we use, um, you know, 250. Okay. Where, where do you... Uh, where, where, <laughs> I'm really trying to drill out. Where do you inject the sub-Q uh, leukine? It, it, uh, anywhere. Okay. It doesn't matter. Um... That's, Jesus. So just to... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah one more thing. Yeah, um, go ahead, Ed. I missed the ADT discussion. Um, uh, it, it's very much convention to give ADT, especially in the, in the context of the SBRT, which I know you're recommending against. Uh, and the notion is that ADT is also an immune adjuvant. Is that, is that the way, is that what I missed as far as AT, ADT usage? Uh, these are the, the concept of immunotherapy or no? Um, uh, if a patient's on ADT and they're doing well, we just suggest they continue on ADT until they become castrate resistant. 
but it's not part of your protocol for prostate auto your auto vaccination in particular. No, no. Okay. It 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 screws us up because we don't know. Um, you know, we don't have a measure of how things are going. Right. Um, I found it fascinating that in your one pro pancreatic cancer case that um, you effectively got what, what is seemingly a cure, at least a long disease free survival for the liver mess, but there was a recurrence in the pancreas in particular. Um, that's fascinating to me because uh, I, the exocrine pancreas, I believe, and it segues into my own theory, the exocrine pancreas in particular, I'm thinking has to be immune privileged because it has very toxic enzymes <clears throat> that you wouldn't want an autoimmune disease to happen to. Um, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm speaking to an evolutionary uh, teleologic explanation for why your, your pancreatic cancer patient would occur locally um, as opposed to anywhere else. That, you know, now, I, I should let other people talk. I'm sorry for hogging the airspace. Yeah, I, I think the... <laughs> the um, uh... Yes, <laughs> is the is the thing I should say about it. yes. Um, the there is a lot that we do not understand. Um, we're finally working with a department of clinical immunology down here in Florida, Nova Southeastern University. Um, once again, we're looking for funding to to do that and. Um, you know, when I came up with this, I took a good guess. Um, guess from partly experience over the years, since we've been looking at it, at this stuff uh, for a long, long time. But um, we need to understand um, why some patients do well, some patients don't. You know, if you have only a 40% success rate on average, you know, why do the 60% not do well? Um, and uh, if somebody like me lasts five years or somebody like um, our other, our first patient lasts, you know, eight years, but um, another patient gets a recurrence in two years, uh, why is that? And so, you know, these are all things that we have to um, find out about. We're at the very, very, very beginning of this. Uh, in, in five years, uh, we're going to know so much more about this and hopefully be a lot better at it than we are now. If you'll allow me just one so, more comment. Uh, hey, Alan, um, we, we do have uh, okay. other okay. people in line. Uh -huh. So okay. let's, uh, let's give yeah. them a chance and we can come back to you uh, as, as time permits. So based on the discussion we just had, um, I mean, I, I wanna kinda uh, mention a couple of things. Um, you know, solid tumor, uh, again, I, my bone, me my meds are all solid bone me uh, meds. And I've always heard that uh, it is very, it's just very hard to get to the, the, the solid tumor. Um, I went through the procedure, the, the two tumor sites that uh, Dr. Onik chose for me were uh, the prostate itself and then um, uh, in pelvic bone. And um, I mean, I had no discomfort, no issues related to the the surgical stuff that he did for, for me. Again, this was just like first time somebody got into you know the the bone to actually um, uh, actually do this for me, and so so kudos to Doctor Onik and uh, his ability to get into the in, in, into the bone meds. Um, second thing, Doctor Onik, in continuation of the you know SBRT and stuff like that. Um, you know, cryoablation, you know, some other doctors who are working on this stuff, uh, they use heat instead of cold. Uh, can you comment on kind of the effectiveness of, uh, uh, you know, your kind of cold cryoablation approach versus the heat approach? Sure. Um, you know, heat um, just doesn't make that much sense in this setting because, um it denatures proteins. You know, I mean, it, it's like, um, you know, you, you cook a steak. It doesn't look like uh, the steak that went in, you know, into the oven. And uh, whereas freezing, you know, that's why you can freeze a steak and it thawed out and it looks like a steak. So um, the, you know, heating 
does not make sense in this setting. Uh, so that's my take on it. And, and I wouldn't expect that uh, long term those results will pan out. But who mm -hmm. knows? Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, um, next, uh, Brian. Uh, by the way, I've got a hard stop in 10 minutes because I've got another okay. conference call I got to be on. So, yep. Great. I, I, I saw that Paul uh, Van Camp had his hand up and I wanted to, he's got it down. I just wanted to defer oh, to no. him. If, if I, you I, uh, the last question partially answered what, what I was going to ask about uh, X-ray SBRT to release antigen into the into the blood to try to stimulate an abscopal response. I recall Veyanda in Australia was being touted as an agent that could uh, pr produce a body wide response after radiation of just one lesion. But now that seems to have disappeared. Um, don't hear about it anymore. And. Uh, uh, I guess other than saying congratulations and thank you for what you're pioneering, Dr. Onik, um, I'm wondering about the use of some syst systemic um, immune cocktail after your treatment to try to uh, augment a more body-wide response. Uh, you know, we are always open to improving what we're doing. Uh, and uh, some of the things that we um, are doing now were actually suggested by patients um, that we've incorporated into our, our uh, treatments. Um, but you, you know, our goal is to, is to get this out there um, in, you know, even if it's in its present form, it's not perfect um, because um, we really think that it, it can make big, big difference for you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of patients. So um, we, you have to, you have to at some point say, okay, this is it. This is what we're going to test. There may be something better. We may be able to improve it, but we got to test something. Um, and so this is what we're going to test. So I think uh, we pretty much have um, our system down. One of the things that we haven't talked about actually is, um, you know, a, a, a something that we have added in in the last couple of years, which is the use of low-dose cyclophosphamide to deplete the Treg cells. And so um, uh, that was not used in our study. Um, uh, so I guess I didn't speak about it, uh, but, but we're now doing that on a, um, on a routine basis. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm going to jump in here, uh, Paul. Sounds like your question was answered. Um, so you talked a little bit about customization of the immunotherapy itself. Um, how do you how do you do the customization? Are there certain types of diagnostics that you use or would use to customize the the immunotherapy? I mean, for example, so we have partnerships with many different companies. Um, Get the Peterson is is here uh, representing one of those. Um, but, you know, we can get access to proteomics, we can get access to spinal, spatial phenotyping or uh, lots of different tests. What would be helpful, um, if anything at all, in customizing the immunotherapy cocktail? I think anything that we can do as we go forward to look at, you know, the proteomics, for instance, um, I, you know, um, one of my great greatest strengths is my ignorance. And so I don't know anything about proteomics, but I know uh, that it's been been brought up and we've discussed it um, with, with experts a number of times uh, in terms of being able to see um, if we can customize the, the uh, procedure. So uh, we're open to, you know, we're gonna be doing a, a, a study, you know, a trial, and we would love I mean, we're going to have tissue, we're going to have blood samples, we're going to have all of those things. And we can, we would love to track anything that anyone would want to look at to see if it can make an impact on the treatment or in the, 
you know, designation of who will do well and who wouldn't do well. I mean, we don't want to uh, be doing procedures on patients that, you know, it's not going to do well. It's just a waste of everyone's resources and time. Uh, but, you know, there, there are some, uh, you know, caveats to that. When we started going to NextGen and looking at uh, expression of the checkpoints in the tumor, uh, we uh, felt that we could improve our results by excluding patients that did not express to a high level those checkpoints uh, in their tumor. And uh, sure enough, uh, that I think um, in retrospect, uh, looking at data panned out. However, we did have a number of patients who uh, got wonderful responses and didn't have the kind of checkpoint expression that you would expect to make them uh, successful. So uh, we found that we couldn't use it uh, clinically as a, an exclusion criteria to say to the patient, look, don't waste your time, don't waste your money, we can't do it, okay? But we're willing to look at all, anybody has anything they wanna study in our patient population to help us figure out who's good or how we can improve it, we'd love to do that. And we want to know as soon as possible so we can get it into the protocol because the protocol is being written now. Okay. So Dr. Onik, we have a list of partners that we'll be happy to share with you. It'll be actually updated on our website in a week's time frame, also, uh, but we'll be happy to share with you. And if there, there's a particular partner that you would prefer us to connect you with, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to do that. So, um, thanks, Brian. Um, uh, get it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first of all, I'm raising my hand also. We should talk, um, Dr. Onik. Uh, we are doing RNA sequencing and we are, there's obviously very complicated and certainly not to be relied on just one biomarker to make those treatment decisions. So that's, uh, but, uh, is the innate immune system functioning? Is it the uh, MHA class genes expressed? There's so many other things to take into consideration. So I'd be happy to send you one of our reports. You can take a look. Oh, it's we, complicated. Yeah. We, we, we'd yeah. love to see that. I think, you know, uh, yeah. we've, we've been talking only about the adaptive immune system here in terms of training you know, the, the tumor to be recognized. But the innate immune system does have a, a very important role because um, it's this, it's the uh, freezing um, that mm -hmm. also damages the tissue, sends out, you know, those signals that uh, basically say, hey, something's been damaged, come here. And so that is an important aspect of, of yep. what we're doing. And we have no idea when we look at somebody's, um, you know, work, whether they have a good, um, you know, innate immune system working or not. So we'd love to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm sure we can get connected. Um, uh, so the other question I have, because we have been doing work in breast, but now also in ovarian cancer and follicular lymphoma, do you have any um, experience with any of those two cancers? Um, not, not lymphoma, um, as of yet, um, and, um, the, uh, ovarian cancer, not as yet either. Um, we have had, uh, we've, uh, the most, um, exotic tumor we've treated is a glioma, glioblastoma and uh, got a really wonderful response in that patient. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, you know, so far there has not been um, a, any particular tumor that has not responded uh, to the treatment. So, um, you know, uh, we would love to try this on those types of tumors. Fantastic. Um, I'm I, I want to thank you for all your work. This is uh, super encouraging, especially for 
the patients on this call that have not responded to <clears throat> their standard of care. And um, I may have seen you before. I, I sincerely hope that you will have a um, response to this um, treatment. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think um, everyone's been uh, a while to get a pat on the back. Sounds great. <laughs> Dr. Anik, thank you so much. I know you have to go. It's uh, uh, 11 a.m. PST.